Dr. Tarun Biswas is in the physics department at SUNY, New Paltz. He has three master's degrees, two in physics and one in computer science, and a PhD in theoretical physics. He is one of the most interesting professors in the country, even if you have never heard of him, and he has some writings that will make him a new light in the skies for many in this community. Today, we're only going to introduce one of them, but it's the type of logic and science that observers dream of. So, how do you think of galaxies? Do you imagine all the stars orbitally bound to the system? Here in the solar system, we have both bound planets in orbit and comets and asteroids that can swing around the sun and escape the solar system. Dr. Biswas wanted us to first understand the different kinds of orbits. The circles and ellipse orbits are familiar to our imaginations, and if you study comets, the hyperbolic and parabolic ones are too. The circular and eccentric orbits are known as bound orbits because they are bound to the system around which they are orbiting. Meanwhile, the hyperbolic and parabolic orbits are unbounded, or escape orbits, where an escape from the system is actually possible. Here in the Milky Way, and in other galaxies, we find dwarf satellites orbiting and sometimes crashing into and through the galaxy. We know that in the early stages of galaxy formation, at least the ones we see today, there are collisions and clusters coming together. Many portions of the interacting groups escape and do not end up in the bound system. This continues at continually slowing rates until there are additional contributions to the system, such as we do often see with gas flows, dwarf satellites, and other globular clusters, filaments, etc. So it brings up the question, do the galaxies we see and attempt to model today have only bound orbit stars, or are there unbounded orbits as well? Well, according to modern cosmology, namely the Lambda Cold Dark Matter model, the stars are assumed to be part of the bound system in relatively circular orbits, and this is where Dr. Biswas took a dirt road. He assumed precisely the opposite. He says this concept, although simple, appears to be absent from previous consideration. Now he wants to clarify that he uses the more common term hyperbolic orbit in his paper to describe the unbounded class of stars, both hyperbolic and parabolic, and as his paper clearly demonstrates what he described as a pleasant surprise, that the model using some unbounded orbits of stars can reproduce the galactic rotation curves without the postulation of dark matter. It also does not require modified gravity. We are now at a critical stage in the process of understanding galaxies, because so far in this series we have now learned the reason galaxies invoke dark matter hypotheses, but that those theories satellite populations of the galaxies, and even basic assumptions about stellar orbits are not in line with the dark matter hypothesis, and they have still not found any new mysterious particles. Perhaps the most critical test of the theories is how well they are able to explain the anomalies, and in terms of galactic anomalies, it doesn't get much weirder than the diffuse and somewhat pitiful galaxy we learned of this week. NGC 1052 DF2 now goes by a much more entertaining name, the galaxy without dark matter. It is poised to entirely rewrite how galaxies form since dark matter is considered a prerequisite, and so in the case of a clear anomaly in the system, it requires a complete rethink of the concept of dark matter in galaxies, especially when you pile on the satellite population problems and their co-rotation, etc. Any proper theory attempting to explain the dark matter effect in galaxies must work in this diffuse galaxy as well, not be throttled by it. Could you imagine that the stars in this diffuse system are not all bound, that some might be hyperbolic? Me too.